So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. I'm excited to have you all join us today, whether you're joining us on Zoom or via Facebook Live. Uh, I'm very excited to have both of our presenters here today. We have Eve, Joy, Eve Choi from Meyer Gardens and Araceli Eikenberry Mancia um, from Plaster Creek Stewards who are here today to share some of the key issues facing our local watershed and also to give you some tips for how you can support the watershed that uh, is in your area. So our program today is going to be interactive, which means that we would like to hear from you. We're gonna be looking closely, thinking deeply and asking questions uh, as we explore watersheds today. So you may see some of these symbols as you go through. We may show a magnifying glass where we're asking you to think about what you're seeing. You may see this kind of thought bubble um, where we're curious about the things that you're wondering about. And then throughout our program today, I encourage you to share uh, your thoughts and your questions in our chat box. Um, so you may see that your chat box in the settings there is set to all panelists. That's the default setting. Um, that means that it's going to send responses to Eve and Araceli and myself. What we would love for you to do today is to change in that drop down menu to select all panelists and attendees. Uh, that means that everybody can see your responses and we can have a, a really rich conversation with everybody who's joining us today. For those of you who are joining us on Facebook, welcome. Um, we're going to have one of our staff people help to relay some of your responses as well. So please feel encouraged to share um, and ask questions as we go through. My name is Megan. Um, I'm going to be on today to uh, share some of the responses that you guys leave in the chat. So again, feel free to share as we go through. We'd love to hear your questions and your comments. Let's go ahead and get started. So I'd like to introduce Eve Choi. She is our curator of horticultural and environmental education here at Meyer Gardens. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm excited to have you guys join us today, whether it's through Zoom or on Facebook Live. Welcome. Um, we're going to kick things off by just talking about what is a watershed? What is this that we're zooming in on today? So uh, the definition of a watershed is an area of land that drains rain and runoff into a common body of water or stream. And so we can look at this at a couple different levels. So the smallest watersheds are drainage areas for small streams and lakes. Um, and then each small watershed is part of a more extensive watershed for a larger stream or lake in the area. And again, um, then those larger watersheds are then part of an even larger drainage network and, and so forth and so on. Um, the largest scale watersheds that um, I talk about are in reference to, we call them basins. So an example of a basin is the Great Lakes Basin. But again, we're zooming in on our local watershed today and what we can do to be good stewards within our local watershed. So I would like to ask you guys right now to think about what your local creek or river is. Do you know what that is? Um, do you know where that local creek or river starts? Um, what types of landscapes that creek or river runs through? Um, where does it end up? As water runs through, again, a watershed is an area of land that drains rain and runoff to a common body of water or streams. So as water is running through those landscapes and draining into that common body of water or stream, um, that connects everything within that watershed. So understanding what our watershed is and our impacts within our watershed is, is a key first step in um, working to become a good steward um, within or a good steward of the environment. So what I want to share with you today, for those of you who might not know um, what your local watershed is, there is a great tool that you can use to locate um, your local watershed and learn about watersheds in your surrounding watersheds as well. Um, Elgro, which is the Lower Grand River Organization of Watersheds, has a Find My Watershed tool. So if you live within um, the area that the Grand River um, or the Grand River um, watershed, you can find smaller watersheds, your local watershed within um, the area surrounding the Grand River. And Elgro, um, 
the Lower Grand River Organization of Watersheds, the organization that created this tool, they work to bring together local municipalities and community stakeholders to address issues facing the Lower Grand River and its watersheds. So um, not only this tool is a great resource, but just also as an organization, a great way to get plugged in and learn what you can do to support um, the local environment and local watershed health. So I have the link for the Find My Watershed tool on this screen. And Megan, can you see my screen okay with the Find My Watershed tool right now? Yes, I can. Awesome. So when I clicked that link, um, you can see we're on Elgro's homepage. If you want to learn more about Elgro, um, this link will also um, take you uh, to their website. But the particular Find My Watershed tool as you can see, if you scroll down, this map shows the different watersheds um, within this area. And if you want, you can click any of these individual um, shaded areas. Each one is a different watershed. And you can learn more about that watershed. If you know where you are on the map, you can zoom in to a specific point to figure out what um, watershed that area of the map is uh, part of, or this is what I prefer to use, the find my watershed by address portion of the tool. And then all you have to do is type your address into the search bar. If I were to do my personal address, I live in Portland. Um, so I actually would be sent over to M Grows website, that's the middle um, Grand River Organization of Watersheds. Um, so I'd actually be outside of El Gro. Um, another great organization if you live in mid Michigan, but for those who are in um, the Grand Rapids area, uh, Meyer Gardens is in Grand Rapids. Um, El Gro is um, the, that local organization. And I am going to type in Meyer Gardens address now. So that's 1000 East Beltline. And then it will move the map to your location. And as you can see, this is shaded like a pink color. And if I click on the map, it tells me that I that Meyer Gardens is part of Plaster, the Plaster Creek watershed. Now I will say if we zoom out just a touch, um, a small portion of our grounds is part of the Cold Brook Creek watershed, but the vast majority is Plaster Creek. So this is, by looking at this tool, we're able to see what water, local watersheds we're a part of. And another great element of this tool is that it lists if there are any watershed partnerships um, active within your watershed. So as you can see, um, it lists the Plaster Creek stewards, a link to their website. It also tells you how many square miles are in the watershed, um, the acres in the watershed, this last piece of information, the hydrologic unit or unit code um, is a uh, that is another way that you can identify a watershed and learn more information about it. But today we're gonna focus in on these first four pieces of information. So when you click on your watershed or you click on any of the watersheds within this tool, you'll get the name, any watershed partnerships, square miles within that watershed, and then the acres in that watershed. And if there is an active partnership, there'll be a link to their website. And this is a great way to learn about others within your watershed that are passionate about um, conserving the environment, conserving the watershed health, and um, can get you plugged in and involved with the local community to learn more about not only what is currently being done to promote the health of your watershed, but what you can do, how you can join in the efforts to support your watershed um, or support your local watershed. And at this point, I am excited to welcome our Araceli Eikenberry Mencia from Plaster Creek Stewards. She is the program manager and she is going to talk with us a little bit more about Plaster Creek and um, what they do at Plaster Creek Stewards. Araceli? 
Hi everyone, thank you for tuning in. Um, yes, yeah, so this right here is Plaster Creek and its watershed. You saw some of the numbers on it, but here's a great visual. Um, in the It looks like we've lost sound from Araceli here for a minute. Hold on just a second, folks, while we work out our technical difficulties here. Hello, everyone. It looks like um, Araceli is going to um, rejoin us, but I thought this might be a good point. I saw some questions in the chat about um, an equivalent for Holland and other ways to get involved in learning more about your local watershed. So while we wait for Araceli to join us from Plaster Creek Stewards, um, I have a question for you guys in the chat. Does anyone here know what watershed um, they are a part of? Okay. Oh, welcome back, Arcelli. Oh, good. Wow. You know, things that you don't expect. The internet just went out for a little bit. Um, cool. That's that's something about the online world. Is that, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Welcome back. Um, <laughs> when we when we lost the feed, you were just starting to talk about Plaster Creek and its watershed and these images. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the Plaster Creek watershed flows into the Grand River watershed. Um, and you can see that Grand River arc up on the top. Thank you. All right. And it looks like we have somebody who's in the Plaster Creek watershed in our tour today. Awesome. awesome. Uh, yeah. Um, so again, there are some numbers. The creek itself is 14 miles long. And the watershed, the area of land that eventually drains into that creek is 58 square miles. And so it's a pretty large watershed and it's fun because we're right on the edge of Grand Rapids. So it's very diverse as well. There's a lot of different land uses and there's a lot of different people who are in this area of land that's all connected by this body of water. So we'll get into some history about the creek because its past and its present are a big part of this creek story. Um, 
many centuries, just a couple centuries ago, uh, this was the ancestral home of the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy of the Ojibwe, Odawa, and the Potawatomi people. Previously, before that, um, it was the home of the Hopewell people. So the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi people tended this creek, tended the land, and used this area for, um, for transportation, for food, for medicine, for home building materials, um, and also for places of worship as well. The creek itself was called Kenoshe, which means water of the walleye. At the time, there were a lot of walleye, a type of fish that swam through this area um, and up and down the creek. The land surface of this creek was very different as well. It was forest, it was meadow and prairie, some wetland, um, a lot of different biomes existed just in this creek's watershed. Then there was European colonization of the area, and when the indigenous peoples living here were pushed out, forced out of the region, um, the type of development that we see in this watershed um, really experienced the change. So today we see farmland, uh, rural homes, urban homes, and then commercial areas like 28th Street, um, if you've been there, also industrial areas around that area, um, 28th Street as well, and then further upstream too, right where it meets the Grand River, we get into some industry. Um, a lot of old industrial buildings that uh, were right on the river at the time of first industrialization in Grand Rapids. So there you can see a visual of some of that spread. You can tell we've got some farmland, some green spaces, um, a lot of yards, um, some of that more dense commercial land and industry. And then you can tell in the center of Grand Rapids, we've got those really dense suburban and urban areas as well. So we've got a question for us. What are some of the problems for Plaster, Plaster Creek? Some of you may know some things already about water, about streams, about water health. Um, but even if you don't, just go ahead and take some guesses. Any answers are welcome about some of the main problems that our creek might face. Wait a few more seconds and then we'll head on. Okay, we will dive right into it then. So one of the main problems, oh, pollution, erosion. Yes, these are great. These are great answers. Mm -hmm. Discharge, erosion, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, so one, one, one uh, issue that contributes to a lot of those is runoff, or like the comment said, um, discharge is a good word for it as well. So runoff is the name um, for water that runs off the surface of impermeable surfaces. So pre-industrialization, pre-urbanization, there were these forests and these prairies and these meadows, right? And so water that hit that land would be absorbed by all those plants or it would soak down past the roots into the ground and over the course of days, slowly make its way into the creek, make its way downhill underground until it reached the creek. Um, what we see with all of these um, hard surface surfaces that water can't get through is an increase in runoff rainwater hits it and because it can't soak in, it runs off the surface and into storm drains, which lead directly into the creek or straight into the creek itself or along the sides of road, on the sides of curbs um, and into the creek. And when that water moves, you know how water is, it picks up whatever is in its path. And that includes a lot of pollutants. Um, in a couple minutes, we'll get more into what kinds of pollutants that runoff carries, but Runoff is a big carrier of pollutants. 
Now, not only does runoff carry pollutants, but the runoff itself is a problem just because the amount of it that is now reaching the creek all at once. So uh, previously, the creek is slow and meandering. That's really healthy for a creek like Plaster Creek. The water can spread out when it needs to. If it floods, it just floods the floodplain um, or the land area around it and is absorbed in the ground. The creek is wavy and it's slow moving. A lot of creatures and a lot of plants can grow in that type of water and that type of speed. When you get all of this rainwater that hits the creek so immediately though, the water ends up flowing really quickly and really straight. Um, and it leads to some channelization as well, where that creek, instead of meandering wide, just becomes um, narrow and really fast flowing. That means that we can't have a really robust ecosystem there in a lot of cases. We can't, um, or it's more difficult for plants and aquatic animals to survive in that kind of aggressive flowing and straight environment. That contributes to erosion, one of those things that a couple of people mentioned in the comments. So when we look at trees, we know that they don't grow like this, right? Has anybody seen trees like this on um, trail hikes or anywhere that you've been? Um, maybe around waterways, that's a good place where we see it. Yeah, seen that before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, the thing is, trees don't grow like that naturally. Um, there had been dirt there. So within this tree's lifetime, there was dirt that covered those roots. And then over the course of time, the river had eroded away that sediment. So we get a lot of um, trees collapsing into the water, a lot of loss of that habitat on the sides of the creek because it is eroding or scouring away um, all the sand and soil that used to be there. Next slide. That causes sediment in the creek. That soil that used to be on the sides of the creek that ends up in the water, it's gotta go somewhere, starts flowing along, that is sediment. Um, a little bit of sediment in the creek is fine, but when there's so much of it, it becomes a pollution issue. It's one, difficult um, for light to infiltrate through that sediment, and that makes it hard on the plant life. And also we've got a lot of little macroinvertebrates like dragonfly larvae, let's say, that live in the rocks under the creek and end up feeding fish and bigger animals in the creek. Um, but when you have too much sediment, it crowds out those rocks. And so those macroinvertebrates can't live and the whole ecosystem kind of collapses on itself because the bugs in the creek don't have a place to live with all this mucky sediment running through it. Thermal pollution. I, I love this one, um, especially if I'm like talking to a group of high schoolers um, who like, I don't know, play basketball or we'll be like doing chalk drawings because um, we're right there and we experience it. If you've ever put your hand on pavement in the summertime, it's really hot. Um, and that's a type of pollution that we don't always think about. Um, we don't see, but it's very real. So because we have these surfaces like pavement and like farmlands where there's not a lot of shade over the ground, the ground heats up really quickly. And the heat doesn't just stay there because when the water flows over that heat, the water absorbs the heat, gets warmed up, and then flows into the creek. And that heat, one, makes it difficult for some species to live, and two, it causes bacteria to thrive in that warmth. So thermal pollution um, is an issue as well, and runoff carries heat from the land into the creek. Bacteria, E. coli, that's another thing that's in our water. Uh, so here we have a picture of the creek before the rain. It's 200 colonies per 100 milliliters of water in that left panel. And what's safe for full body contact is 130 colonies. So even on a like pretty low day for Plaster Creek, there's still more E. coli than is safe for humans to be swimming in. Uh, the second image is after a rain. So after that runoff came into the watershed and carried um, the evidence of us living our lives on the land into the creek, uh, there are 24,000 colonies, which is far more than the safer contact 130 colonies. So this water um, is very unsafe for human contact. People can't uh, swim in this water. They can't bathe in this water. They can't drink in this water. 
um, we're unable to use the water in a way that could be really rich and meaningful to all of us in this community. Excess nutrients, that's another one here. In the image we're looking at, there's some grass flowing right um, into the creek. Uh, and it looks like this grass might be fertilized or definitely mowed as well. When we get lawn clippings or fertilizers that are near the watershed um, or picked up by that runoff, it adds too many nutrients to the creek and that causes imbalance in the nutrient cycles there. Trash and toxic substances. This is a pretty easy one because it's easy to see um, when it comes to trash that ends up in the creek. We've also got to toxic substances and things like microplastics and little bits of styrofoam too that are carried to the creek by runoff. So we come to a question. We've talked about all of these problems so we have to ask ourselves if we're if we are living in the watershed um, or traveling in the watershed or maybe you live in a different watershed but all of us live in a watershed because water rains everywhere and that water's got to go somewhere um oh we have a question i'm gonna hit that right now is all of plaster creek unsafe for contact you know that is a great question um some parts of plaster creek are less safe than others and that's because um pollutants go through this like compounding effect, right? If you can imagine the creek is like a funnel uh, where we've got this area of land up top with a lot of little creeks that flow into Plaster Creek and the land surface is large, but when it reaches the creek, it is concentrated. Um, and you can imagine like, let's say you have like a sheet of paper and that represents all the land and you've got little dots or like little chips of pollutants all over that sheet of paper. when you wash all of those pollutants away in a rainstorm onto one little point, you end up with a lot of pollutants concentrated in the area. So all the pollutants from upstream end up concentrating um, in downstream areas. So the most hazardous part of a watershed will be that downstream area. Um, upstream in the headwaters of the creek, there's less pollution, right? Because there are fewer lawns, fewer farms, just less land um, that is contributing to the pollution in that creek. So it might be safer upstream at the start of it, um, but pretty consistently throughout the watershed just because the state of this creek is so bad. Um, I wouldn't be swimming in any part of it. And even the headwaters are up in farmland. So there's a lot of E. coli that ends up being there from manure and fertilizers and um, animal farms and that kind of thing. Um, and actually that's a great point too, when we dig a little deeper into what it means that pollution is worst in the lowest parts of the watershed. So in the Grand Rapids area, um, our water ends up in the Roosevelt Park community and right before that the south East Grand Rapids area. Um, and what we see there and what's true for so many watersheds like throughout the globe is that we get communities of color and low income communities are almost always concentrated in the downstream areas. Um, that's because of a couple reasons, including like home values and historic segregation and um, the fact that industrialization happened in the lower parts of the watershed first because access to water was more plentiful um, and that was needed for transport and industry at the time. Um, so we've got these like hazardous, industrial, very polluted environments where people of color in lower income neighborhoods are living. And then we've got everybody else contributing to the pollution. Um, and so the term for that is environmental justice, right? When Everybody's contributing to pollution, but only some people are experiencing the worst of it. Um, there's, there's inequity there. So that's environmental injustice. And then when you look at the racial element of it and the class element of it and see that people of color and lower income communities are living in these neighborhoods and communities of color is more relevant as a factor than um, class, it's actually like race is the number one factor for how many environmental hazards you live by statistically. Um, we call that environmental racism when we look at the racial aspect of it. Um, 
Yeah, so we look at that environmental racism and environmental justice, and we want to fix that, right? Because we want equity in our watersheds. We want our watershed to be a place where all of us can thrive, um, and we're all responsible for our pollution. And that's called environmental justice. So that's what we will dig into next, and actually what we're talking about um, right now. So we look at that problem, and we have to ask ourselves, what can we do? Whether we're upstream or downstream in the watershed, our water is flowing somewhere. You know, there's always somebody more downstream and there are always creatures um, or a creek where we live and we wanna take care of that. So regardless of where we are in the watershed, what can we do to contribute to the solution of this environmental and human problem? And Araceli, we have a little bit of a delay from the feedback on Facebook. So we, yeah. I'll let you know when the question goes out to Facebook and we start getting some of that feedback. Sure, thank you. So yeah, for anyone in our audience, whether Facebook or Zoom, any ideas, what can we do? What can what can we do to be better stewards of the environment? What can be done to help? How can we be part of the solution? One thought that I like to think of when talking about solutions, um, just an idea is that like, we, we, we're living here, right? Like human life, is going to produce byproducts, right? Like humans are animals and every animal and humans especially, we, we take things in and we put things out in our environment. Um, so it's not, it's not a bad thing to be living here and it's not a bad thing to be producing pollutants necessarily, but um, it's, a, it's a matter of being responsible with those pollutants of um, maybe managing them or maybe dealing with them ourselves or reducing them. Um, there's a lot of different things we can do to still be able to live here and still be able to live rich and full lives while also making sure that we're living in our watershed responsibly. Awesome, so we've got some answers coming in. One says, minimize the use of fertilizer and insecticides on our lawns. Yes. Another one, um, Capture rainwater on site, rain gardens. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So that um, that keeps that water where it lands, um, a little bit like it it would be if there were plants growing. Mm -hmm. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Deal with our trash responsibly. Yes, that keeps all of that out of the creek if we're dealing with it in that way. Ooh, Clark Retirement Community is participating in the study. Does that help? Is there an analysis of runoff when farmland to runoff today? Oh, yes, I heard that Clark Retirement Community was going to be tuning in, live streaming together. I'm excited to see your comment. Thank you. Um, and yeah, they're participating in some Plaster Creek uh, restoration projects. Uh, so yes, that does help. Whether you're putting in a rain garden or whether you're helping with research, um, all of that contributes to our knowledge on the creek and our knowledge on how we can help the creek and also reduces pollution if you've got things like rain gardens going on. Um, do we have an analysis right now of the creek itself? We do studies on erosion and we do studies on bacteria um, to like monitor the health of the creek, but there is so much changing in our watershed right now. Um, like you can, you can imagine when the, like say the Amazon plant um, popped up uh, or was built. That's a whole lot of parking lot that was added to our watershed. So on the one hand, we've got people putting in rain gardens and huge bioswales. Um, and on the other hand, we have parking lots going up and parking lots going down. So there's so much that's happening in a cycle right now um, that it's hard to get like a, a good grasp on the small changes that are happening um, to be able to say from a huge scale measurement of the creek. Um, exactly what changes have been happening. But yeah, anything, anything helps. 
Uh, rain barrels, yes, rain barrels are great because again, they keep that runoff um, from your roof on site instead of letting it carry pollutant, like travel over pollutants and carry those pollutants into the creek. Yes, these are all great answers, great ways that we can take care of our creek together. I love it, thank you. Yeah, so this question and this kind of brainstorming that we all just did right now is what birthed Plaster Creek Stewards in 2009. So Plaster Creek Stewards is housed out of Calvin University. And um, we were wondering how can, well, the people before me, the institutional we, <laughs> were wondering, we, we live and teach and study and work in this watershed. Um, there's a problem right now. We're contributing to that problem. How can we be a part of the solution? And Plaster Creek Stewards as a nonprofit um, became the answer. So we are a collaboration of Calvin University, of local schools, of local churches and other houses of worship and other community partners to work together to restore health and beauty to the Plaster Creek watershed. Um, so this right here, this is an example of a pipe that carries runoff into the creek. Thanks. Um, a way to deal with that is rain gardens. Quite a few people mentioned this. This is an example of a rain garden. You can see it's at the bottom of a slope where water will flow into it, and it's got a lot of plants there. So it's a garden, um, and those plants are great at taking care of runoff. Next. Um, you can see the shape here. Water, again, flows into the basin where the plants can do what plants have always done, what plants are so good at doing, which is absorb water um, and transpire it up through their leaves eventually, help filter that water. And then the roots act like little channels, little tunnels that extra water can flow past and down into the ground. Okay, this, I love this graphic um, and I hope you do too. So this is talking about the root systems of native prairie plants. On the very far left, you can see like a little, a little black smudge of illustration. And that right there is lawn grass. So lawn grass is a couple inches out of the ground on the top and just a couple inches of roots underground as well. So water can soak through the ground over grass, but not very much of it because um, it doesn't do a good job of letting the water through because its roots are so shallow. It can't hold a lot of water. These native prairie plants though, on the rest of the graphic have roots, goodness, some of them are like 16 feet um, into the ground where water will flow through those and be absorbed by those plants. And that's because a lot of them have evolved, say in Michigan, Michigan native plants, they've evolved for our cold winters, they have to survive those um, and our dry springs as well. So they invest a lot of their energy into um, their underground portions. We grow a lot of these native plants. Uh, this is outside of our greenhouses on Lake Drive. Um, you can see our plants, they're in that area. If they're out in the sun, they're ready for us to use them in our rain garden projects and other bigger um, green infrastructure projects like rain gardens, bioswales, um, which are like big rain gardens. And you'll often see them on the sides of parking lots, retention ponds, that kind of thing. These are our seedlings. Um, on the left, you see some really tiny plants. Those have just sprouted after a winter, um, sitting outside of our greenhouses. They know, boom, winter has passed, and now it's springtime. It's ready for us to sprout. Uh, and we grow them up like that. And then next photo, a child's holding these little plugs of native plants. Those are some sedges with these really dense root systems. So you can see that even when the plants are young, they have these deep roots that are ready to go in the ground and ready to start absorbing, cleaning, slowing down water. Um, here we've got some volunteers planting with us on a buffer strip. Um, so volunteers will sometimes help us out at our greenhouses and transplanting those seedlings and sometimes look out to big projects like this and plant trees and native plants. A buffer strip is an area that protects um, a creek or a waterway from some sort of land use to the other side. So you've got, say, a farm on one side, and then the riparian buffer, like this strip of native plants, and then the creek on the other side. 
So those native plants, again, protect the creek by catching that water before it flows into the water. Uh, this is a bioswale. This is right on Calvin's campus. It's a little horseshoe shape. So any water that comes from the parking lot on one side will enter the basin, flow through that horseshoe shape where all the plants around it can absorb it, and eventually into a drain that leads into the creek on the other side of that hill. Here is another rain garden. This is around like a tiny creek at our greenhouses. Um, it's a buffer strip between the lawn and the little creek itself. And this is a curve cut rain garden. So our streets are shaped with tilt so that the water flows to the side, hits the curb and flows along the curb till it hits a storm drain, which goes into underground creeks that have been put into tunnels. Um, and what we can do is say, well, not only am I going to process the storm water that hits my property, but I'm going to put a rain garden on the curb and I'm going to cut the curb so that any storm water flowing down my neighborhood's street will flow into my garden and the plants in this garden will absorb that water. So you see the cut in the curb where the street water flows into the garden in that parkway and you see the native plants that are catching that storm water when it rains. It's really cool to see these in action because during a rainstorm, you'll see the water rushing into that um, curb cut until the garden is full and the plants drinking it up. So of all the, I have a comment here, of all the plants in the Plastic Creek watershed, how many are of each root type? Um, goodness, yeah, that's a great question. For Plaster Creek watershed, um, because so like Michigan does have consistently these harsh winters and these often dry seasons in the summer, um, all of the plants here have evolved to deal with that. And so the majority of them have um, like robust root systems to help them get through that climate. So if it's a Michigan native, it's probably pretty good at dealing with water because it's had to deal with water and freezing um, its entire life as a species. Uh, yeah, so I would say the majority. And then um, all of the plants that we use for sure have roots that are good at handling water. Um, mm -hmm. um, this is a storm drain and in front of it there's text that says dump no waste drains to stream. There's a beautiful picture of that fish. Um, maybe some of you have seen this before. So this is a sign reminding us that whatever we do on the land ends up in the water. Um, now, some people think that the storm drains will lead to some sort of processing plant, uh, but that is not the case. That water isn't treated. In fact, it goes through tunnels that flow straight into our streams. Um, one thing to note is that when suburbanization was happening in Grand Rapids and the people in charge of the city at the time wanted more dry land to build a development, um, they took creeks that were running through the land and put them in pipes and sunk those pipes underground. So underneath a lot of the streets in Grand Rapids, there will be what once was a free flowing creek in the area, but now is just a concrete tube under the road where that creek flows until it empties into Plaster Creek, empties into the Grand River, um, that kind of thing. So we've got these underground creeks. Silver Creek is one of them. There are a couple spots where it opens up on the surface again, it daylights, but then it goes back into a pipe underground where it um, flows until it flows into Plaster Creek. So yeah, it's good to um, clean these storm drains out. If there are like a lot of leaves clogging it up, um, you can take those leaves out or protect it by putting um, curb cut rain gardens in front of it because we want gardens to absorb that water, not the storm drains. Because again, those lead right into the creek. Rain garden along a street with a curb cut. Can it survive salt and sand runoff from winter? Yeah, that is a great question. It's actually something that um, we might be studying right now or we've studied in the past. Every summer we do research with our Calvin University students who are hired with us for the season. 
Um, and people are studying like what plants can tolerate the highest salt and is salt from road runoff an issue for our native plants? Um, all plants have a coefficient of con conservation, is that it? Forget the term exactly, but there's a number um, and more than just a thing that we study, it's like a whole concept that some plants can tolerate a lot of um, disturbance and like a lot of diversity in their situation. Um, and so it's usually those hardy plants that can handle a lot, that can handle the hot, that can handle the cold, they can handle acidity and basic water. They can handle a lot of different things. Um, or generalists, those are the ones that we use in the curb cut rain gardens. There are some more delicate plants that are more rare and need like really specific conditions to survive. We don't use those in our curb cuts because they wouldn't make it, but we use them in our like bigger restoration projects. Like if somebody wants to set aside a couple acres to be um, like a natural prairie, we'll use those more um, needy plants there. And then once they're in that environment that's right for them, they just thrive, they love it. So how should we dispose of water used to clean paint rushes? That is a good question. I think for most paints, um, they'd be using like in like a household or studio setting, that should be okay to send down the drain, um, especially if your water goes to a filtration plant. Um, if you have a septic system, uh, I'm not too sure, but I think Household paints are probably okay to put down your drain. All right, we also hire a green team. I talked about um, hiring summer students. Uh, we hire high schoolers as well. And they, oh, those high schoolers do a lot of our like transplanting and planting. They learn about environmental racism and ecology. This is another restoration site. Uh, this is a spot in Silver Creek where it used to just flow straight. We put in pits and mounds so now Silver Creek can flood into these beautiful ponds and be filtered before it continues on underground. Um, so yeah, these are some of the things that we can do. Um, again, we are Plastic Creek Stewards. We're just one organization doing this work. Um, but if you want to get involved with us, feel free to reach out to me. My email is aje32 at kelvin.edu. We've always got spring, fall events, and opportunities to volunteer. And um, again, we hire high schoolers who live and work in our watershed too. So now we have a question for you all. Um, what is something that you can do to be a good steward of your watershed, wherever you live? Yeah, thank you so much, Araceli. So much wonderful information about um, the work being done with Plaster Creek Stewards. Um, we actually have an event coming up uh, next week in partnership, Meyer Gardens in partnership with Plaster Creek Stewards that I'll um, talk a little bit more about. But again, thank you so much. Um, so much great work being done, great ideas. So now for those of you who are in the audience, regardless of whether you live in Plaster Creek, um, the Plaster Creek watershed or elsewhere, what, what is one thing, um, we've got a lot of ideas that were thrown out here, um, but what's one thing that uh, you can do um, to be a good steward of your watershed? Or even one thing that you are doing, just one, what's one takeaway? In the chat, speak up at planning commissions and defense of watersheds. Absolutely, get involved with your local government. Um, get involved with local organizations um, defending the health of watersheds. Uh, I see Donna. So that last comment was from Barbara. Donna says, plant native prairie plants in your garden. Absolutely. Um, it sounds like uh, Plaster Creek Stewards and, uh, is a great resource to get connected with. Um, a source of those native plants that you can incorporate in your garden. Absolutely. 
And I noticed that I did say native prairie plants and those have the deepest roots, um, but a lot like any of the native plants from Michigan are great. And we do have plants, all native growers should have plants um, that work for wet areas. If you have like a pretty wet yard or if you have a sandy yard, if you have a sunny yard, a shady yard. Um, yeah, there's so many different plants that evolved here. So we've got things for um, most environments that you can find in Michigan. <laughs> Absolutely. So incorporating native plants in your landscape wherever you can. Um, Kathy suggests be a basin buddy in the city of Grand Rapids. Um, Patricia is sharing that they have reduced the size of their lawn by planting a large garden of native plants. Great. And I know I'm still, um, I haven't seen the question pop up on Facebook yet. So we haven't received any of our feedback from feedback from our Facebook Live students or Facebook Live viewers yet, but lots of great ideas. Um, and again, getting involved with your local, local uh, Watershed Action Council is a great way to get plugged in and um, get involved with a community of people who are working together to support the watershed said, um, find strength in numbers that way. Um, I have a list of just some general ways that the EPA recommends that these are some steps that anyone can take to help support their watershed. Um, it can be as easy as um, conserving, taking steps to conserve water every day, taking shorter showers, fixing leaks, and turning off water when not in use. Um, there were some comments about what can be poured down the drain. So if you have toxic household chemicals, um, not pouring those down the drain and instead taking them to a hazardous waste center for disposal. I just um, looked that up. It does say to not put it down the drain. I was very <laughs> wrong about that. And I need to change my painting habits. So I'm grateful for that question. <laughs> and I would encourage anybody, if you have a question about usually, um, chemicals or anything with toxic chemicals will have some sort of um, note about disposal or if you um, go online and find some more information um, from the institution that produces the chemical, they usually have some more um, direction for that. But you can always contact a hazardous waste center and let them know what you're looking to dispose and get some um, advice on that. Uh, so um, also, we had talked about using hardy plants that require little or no, no watering, um, fertilizers or pesticides in your yard. Um, also being careful not to over apply fertilizers. Um, we talked about the impact of um, over application and um, how excess fertilizers um, into um, being introduced into the system, those negative um, effects that can have. So consider using um, slow release fertilizers instead, being very thoughtful about the amount of fertilizers that you apply um, to your yard. If you're applying any, um, you can recycle yard waste in a compost pile or use a mulching mower. Um, and even using surfaces like wood, brick, or gravel um, as an alternative for decks and walkways, which better allow rain to soak in and not run off. Um, also, again, being careful what goes down into those um, stormwater drains. Um, so never pour used oil or antifreeze into the storm drain or on the street, um, picking up after it, even for those of you who have dogs, I have a dog, um, a German shepherd at home and always very careful to pick up after her um, because, and disposing of that waste responsibly um, is very important. And finally, even as simple as figuring out ways to drive less, whether that's walking when you're able to, biking, um, carpooling, when you have the chance, many pollutants in our waters come from car exhaust and car leaks. So um, driving less is a way that is a simple step that we can take um, to help reduce that impact. So I want to again, thank you so much, Araceli, for joining us. Um, and for those of you, oh, I see one more chat question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so Deanna says, how does creating a cross country and bicycle motocross route in a hillside park 
um, impact the watershed, wetlands, and wildlife? Is it a negative, positive, or neutral impact? Mm -hmm. So um, that's something that I would want to take a little bit I, I would want to look a little bit more into the specific project that you're talking about, Deanna, um, depending on how it was approached, um, impacts would vary. Um, Araceli, do you have any comments or feedback on this question? Yeah, yeah, just with like the limited information there. Um, it sounds to me like one of the biggest impacts would probably be erosion, especially mm -hmm. on a hillside, right? Like wherever we have exposed soil, um, mm -hmm. There's going to be water that erodes that soil away and carries it downstream. Um, so probably not a whole lot of like chemical pollutants, but the erosion of one during the process of that development, mm -hmm. and then two, once that trail is in there, um, all the erosion that happens. Um, but honestly, like that, that is a nice like concluding question. Um, Cause we want things like that, right? We want things like bicycle and motocross routes, um, like even out in nature. Um, we just have to figure out how to do that in a responsible way or in a way that our creek can handle because creeks are resilient right creeks mm -hmm. go through a lot um, and plaster creek has been through a lot um, but the encouraging thing is is that like human development has so much been a part of the problem but human like green development and human action human intentionality and stewardship and reconnecting with our creek can like well will be a part of the solution um so whether it's like native plants to catch that sediment before it runs into the creek or um plants to catch runoff you know whether it's a trail or a housing development um a, a university or a um, gardens and sculpture park um, you know, there are ways that we can live well as a part of our watershed, because um, humans are humans are a part of the animal community. Um, there is a way for us to live well in our environment. Uh, so yeah, thank you all. Um, and let's see if there's something else, but I was and, and again, that's a great um, segue into my last comment is just to share a little bit about a river cleanup that we're going to be doing in partnership with Plaster Creek Stewards. If you live locally and you're available and would like to join us for a volunteer um, community cleanup event on Tuesday, September 7th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., um, we are hosting a community cleanup in um, collaboration with Plaster Creek Stewards. Um, you can visit MeyerGardens.org, our website, to get more information about that. If you either, when you go to our website, you can type in community cleanup into the search bar and that event will pop up. Otherwise, you can go to our calendar, click on September 7th to find in or to find the link to enroll for the cleanup. We are asking that you register ahead of time so that, um, uh, so that we know that you're coming. And once that you register, um, we'll give you some more information along with location and final details for the day of. So if you're available, I encourage you and welcome you um, to join us on Tuesday, September 7th for a community cleanup with Plaster Creek Stewards. That'll be taking place from 10 to 12. You can register for that on MeyerGardens.org. We would love to have you with us. Otherwise, I encourage you to um, find one takeaway um, from our discussion today and um, use that moving forward to help support your watershed. And um, maybe even if you're not living within the Placer Creek area, I encourage you to see if there are any watershed action councils active within your watershed, find your watershed, see if there are watershed action councils working together um, to support uh, ecosystem health within where you live. And I encourage you to get involved and share with us um, what you're doing. So thank you so much. Yeah. Um, awesome. Thank you for joining. Yeah, thank you everybody.